So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us from corners far and near. Uh, it's a pleasure. I think this means we have quite a array of folks, and uh, I think it should be very interesting, the topic that we have. Just very quickly, <coughs> excuse me. My name is Stan Botts. I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, and I'm a retired ethics officer with Verizon Communications. I've also served as a commissioner of occupational professional licensing for the state of Maryland and a commissioner on the water and sewer authority. Uh, I, I'm happy to be here again this year. And uh, I would like to take a couple of minutes and let the other judges introduce themselves. Jesse, you wanna go first? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. So yeah, my name is Jesse. I'm also uh, very pleased to be here. Um, I'm the founder and president of an international organization that works with uh, artificial intelligence to try to make the world a better place. We do two things. One is uh, on the project side, we work with satellite data to implement machine learning for conservation efforts. And then on the research side, we're operationalizing ethics uh, to try and show business outcomes. And as far as I know, we're the only organization that's currently doing that in a way that tries to uh, quantify the effects of actually putting AI ethics into a framework that can be used for programmers and data scientists. I'm also a data scientist uh, uh, technologist uh, myself, so I, I have experience doing that and saw firsthand the ethical dilemmas that were involved with uh, creating technologies and what they could uh, possibly do that wasn't necessarily to make the world a better place. So that's how I got into what I'm doing. I'm currently in Hanoi, as you mentioned, uh, because we're doing a conservation effort project here and also because my wife is a Taiwan diplomat um, and posted here. I've been in Asia since 2005, and our organization is in Singapore, Japan, Thailand, uh, Taiwan, and Vietnam. So happy to be here, happy to offer uh, my advice, and uh, especially from the business side. And I've certainly had sort of my fair share of ethical dilemmas and been behind the corporate veil a few times. Uh, before I got into AI, I was a uh, business consultant and we, we worked with mostly multinationals and I got to see just how difficult it is to actually implement uh, solutions that can get the buy-in that is required. So I'm really looking forward to hearing how you tackled this very important topic today and uh, looking forward to giving you my feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, is John with us? Yes. Okay, John, you wanna go next? Sure. Uh, my name is John Truslow. I'm the Director of Ethics and Business Conduct for BAE Systems. Um, I'm here in Amherst, New Hampshire, right on the Massachusetts, New Hampshire line. Um, BAE Systems is, um, is a British company. It is the largest British defense company, and it is the fourth largest defense company in the world. So there are British operations and there are US operations and global operations. Uh, I'm the Director of Ethics and Business Conduct for the electronic systems part of the business. So we manufacture um, high integrity uh, electronic components that go into lots of other things, everything from flight control systems uh, to hybrid electric buses um, to weapon systems. So um, that's me. It's really nice to be with you guys. Okay. And nice our other judge, go ahead. Uh, me now? <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm I'm Dr. Ahmed uh, um, in Dubai. I am uh, one of the senior digital transformation consultants for the chief commander of Dubai Police. Um, and uh, basically, um, uh, me and my team are in charge of um, the uh, several concepts at Dubai Police. One of them is the uh, compliance and the governance, and of course. Um, <clears throat> the transparency and ethics. We're also responsible for the AI ethics in particular um, in because Dubai Police is very forward thinking when it comes to AI and it's implemented almost uh, everywhere in our uh, core business. So basically ethics play a, a great role uh, in that as well as uh, Dubai Police prides itself in being one of the soft policing organizations. So the amalgamation of transparency and ethics and soft policing and governance and compliance all together uh, brings out um, a very nice dish 
that we deal with at Dubai. So we're pretty unique when it comes to uh, implementing uh, the concept of ethics and transparency. Okay. I'm happy to be with you guys as well. Thank you. Nick, did I get everyone? Uh, I believe so. Okay. So with that, what I'll do is I will now start by reading what are the <clears throat> instructions for the team for this 30-minute uh, uh, or 25-minute presentation. And uh, then I'll let the team introduce itself and get started. Okay, in this part of the competition, you are taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to the judges. Please make sure everyone knows who you are and who they are before you begin. And let me reemphasize that. Let us know who you are and who we are in this role playing. <clears throat> you will have 25 minutes with a five minute cushion to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three counts. During this time, teams will be uninterrupted. When you're finished, the judges will ask you questions for 20 minutes from their role playing part. <clears throat> During the Q&A, both you and the judges stay in character. After the Q&A, the judges will give you feedback outside the role playing. Some important things to keep in mind, the ethical aspects of your analysis are the most important part. This is a business ethics competition. The ethical aspects of the analysis are the most important. However, these should be described in a simple, practical, common sense fashion. Fashion, excuse me. <clears throat> Using ethical, technical, philosophical terminology or basing your argument on religious or theological grounds will be considered a serious weakness. During this presentation, every member of the team must have some sort of speaking role. With that, I'll turn it over to the stats and team that you introduce yourself and we will start and when you have uh, started and you're near the end, I'll give you a five minute warning to wrap up your presentation. Perfect, thank you so much, everyone. We're really happy to be here. And so we, as you said, are representing the Stetson undergraduate team. In this role playing, we will be representing Top Hat Consulting and uh, we will be presenting to Mr. Gene Lee, the head of Darden and his senior staff members. Uh, do you want to introduce the individual members of your team? Sure. So uh, my name is Talia Kalada. I'm a senior here at Stetson. My name is Claudia Krass, and I'm a junior at Stetson. I'm um, Stephen Rarig, and I am a junior at Stetson as well. Afternoon. I'm Matt Lawrence. I'm a senior year finance and accounting major at Stetson. Okay, with that, you can begin. I will be timing you and I will give you a warning at about the 25 minute mark. Thank you. Talia, are you ready with the presentation? Yes, can everyone see? Can everyone see it all right? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, without further ado, let's get started. Meet Bonnie Jacobson a 34-year-old married woman who worked as a waitress at Red Hook Tavern in New York City. In early 2021, when the COVID-19 vaccines began to roll out, many workers both within her workplace and across the community were eager to receive it. However, Bonnie had reservations about it. The COVID-19 vaccines are the fastest vaccines ever developed. Even as of now, the potential side effects are still unknown. Not only was Bonnie concerned for her own health and safety, but also that of a potential child she hoped to be pregnant with soon. A manager at Red Hook initially told her that the vaccine would not be mandatory for employees, but on February 12th, the business decided otherwise and notified employees that the vaccine was required to work unless personal health or disability got in the way. Bonnie responded to the email asking for more time to do her own research, but only two days later, she was fired from her job. This is an example of the potential conflict Darden could face if the company mandated the COVID-19 vaccine for employees. Good afternoon, Mr. Lee and Darden staff members. I'm Matt Lawrence. I'm Claudia Krass. I'm Talia Collada. I'm Stephen Rarig. 
and we are Top Hat Consulting. Today, we will be analyzing if Darden Restaurant should implement a coronavirus vaccine mandate for its employees, not mandate the vaccine, or if there is a better solution for this dilemma. Today, during our presentation, we will be walking you through the background on how COVID-19 has impacted American businesses, as well as Darden specifically. We will then investigate the numerous stakeholders impacted by the decisions recommended today before analyzing the financial, legal, and ethical considerations. Finally, we will give you our plan for the coming months ahead. But before we do that, let us review the current state of the vaccination program in the United States. As of September 2020, almost 100,000 businesses have purpose permanently closed down due to the pandemic. Vaccination rates are rapidly increasing every day with the vaccine becoming more widely accessible to the public. In September, 51% of people said that they had intentions to get the vaccine. As of February, the intent to be vaccinated had increased to 69%. Meanwhile, 48% of companies in the US stated that they will not require their employees to be vaccinated. 43% are still unsure, and only 0.5% of companies have already mandated the vaccination for all of their employees. Darden is an industry leader, and whatever you decide to do will set the bar for others in the sector. We advise that Darden restaurants should not mandate employee vaccinations, rather strongly encourage your employees to get the vaccine without infringing upon the individual rights of others. Now Stephen will go over the affected stakeholders. Thank you, Talia. The main stakeholders that will be affected by your decision to mandate or not mandate vaccines for employees can be separated into two groups, internal and external stakeholders. Internal stakeholders are the individuals that work directly within the company, such as Darden's employees and Darden restaurants as a whole. Darden's employees will either be mandated to take the COVID-19 vaccination, or they will be given the option to choose if they want to take the vaccine. Darden restaurant employees will be required to abide by the company policy regarding the COVID-19 vaccination. Darden restaurants as a whole will be impacted by the vaccination policy decided upon. The marketing strategies, safety practices, financial plan, and overall brand will be impacted. Now, let's talk about external stakeholders. External stakeholders are the individuals that do not work directly for Darden restaurants, but will be impacted by the policy decision. External stakeholders include the shareholders, customers, and other competitors in the industry. Shareholders could be impacted by stock prices fluctuating due to this decision. They could lose money if Darden does not mandate the vaccination of employees. You may lose customers and experience financial losses if employees quit or are terminated for not following a vaccine mandate policy. This could cause a shortage of labor. Darden's customers and the communities you serve will be impacted by the company's vaccine policy. The contagious nature of the virus makes it easily transferred from the employees to the customers. This can then lead to customers contracting the virus, which could further expose the community. Therefore, mandating the vaccine could help prevent community spread. The restaurant industry will also be affected. As Darden Restaurants is the largest sit-down restaurant corporation in the world, all decisions that are made will be carefully watched and likely considered by other companies in the industry. Next, my colleague Matt will discuss the financial impacts COVID-19 has had on the restaurant industry and Darden. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, Darden's performance was outstanding. From 2017 to 2019, the company was able to outperform its major competitors, including other large multi-brand casual dining companies, such as Cheesecake Factory, Bloomin Brands, and Brinker International. Darden led these companies in revenue, gross profit, and earnings per share growth. Darden has excelled in strategic management decisions and has used its superior scale in the industry to achieve these results. As we all know, that forward momentum would unfortunately come to a halt in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. From the start of the shutdowns in March until July, 26,000 restaurants closed in the U.S., 16,000 of which can be definitively connected with the pandemic. By January, that total grew to 110,000, with 75% of operators or owners stating that they had no plans to reopen. This figure accounted for 17% of the total restaurants in the U.S. 
16% of the total closures were restaurants that had at least 30 years of history. Even financially healthy companies such as Starbucks and Dunkin' closed a combined 1,600 locations temporarily or permanently. The industry also saw large players in Ruby Tuesday and Sizzler go bankrupt. The negative effects trickled down to employees as well. Eight million restaurant workers were fired or laid off in 2020 as a result of COVID-19, proving how the restaurant industry was one of the most impacted industries in the market. Darden was no exception to this struggling industry. Revenues dropped 43% for the fiscal quarter ending 5-31-2020, year over year. The company quickly adjusted, limiting costs as much as possible during lockdowns and restrictive times, but still saw net income de decline to negative $155 million. Free cash flows dropped from a healthy $358 million to negative $294 million from March until the end of May. Many locations had to completely close dining areas. Darden was forced to wait until mid-May before it had over half of its dining areas partially open. As for employees, roughly 150,000 or 81% of all employees were fired or laid off during the pandemic. As you know, Darden was forced to make important, quick decisions in response to what was happening in the marketplace. You were forced to furlough many workers to cut expenses. All dining rooms were shut down as a result of mandates by the government. On April 20th of 2020, Darden announced a public offering of 7.8 million shares at a price of $58.50 in order to raise capital for the company. And as was a custom in the corporate world during the pandemic, executive employee salaries were cut in order to save funds as well. Since May of 2020, Darden has slowly and steadily recovered financially. Revenues have consistently been increasing since the early summer. Currently, over 99% of your dining areas are operating at full or partial capacity, a huge positive since over half were still shut down as of last May. Perhaps the most impressive indicator of the health of your recovery is the number of stores open. During 2020, Darden increased its number of locations despite these hardships from 1,804 locations to 1,818. With improving economic conditions, Darden hopes for business to return to its usual level soon. According to multiple surveys and studies, eight out of 10 restaurant customers say they couldn't replicate their favorite restaurant foods at home, six out of 10 say restaurants are an essential part of their lifestyle, and 78% agreed that going out to restaurants was one of the things they missed most since the start of COVID-19. Keeping Darden's recent financial history and current financial position in mind, let's analyze the financial consequences of requiring or not requiring employees to take a COVID-19 vaccination. There are a few reasons why having all of Darden's employees vaccinated could lead to greater financial success for 2021. If all employees were vaccinated, the company could boast about that to customers and create a COVID safe environment for those eating at the restaurants. Capacities could be potentially increased, leading the way for more sales and revenues from in-person dining. Unfortunately, there are also many reasons why requiring workers to get vaccinated might not be the best option. In order to create a completely safe environment in dining areas, not only would employees have to be vaccinated, but all present, including customers. Having all employees vaccinated creates little positive effect if some of the customers aren't. Darden would not be able to create a much safer environment if this were the case. If Darden made the vaccine mandatory for employees, many workers might be tempted to quit. Although the list of Americans that do not want to take the vaccine is slowly diminishing, they still account for a considerable part of the population. Recent surveys show that 15% of Americans will definitely not take the vaccine. When accounting for the ages of these respondents and factoring in typical age statistics in the restaurant industry, it can be estimated that about 15.25% of all Darden's employees will not take the vaccine. This could lead to employee frustration and potentially some leaving the company, which would have negative financial consequences. Darden taking a middle ground approach could be the best solution. Daily COVID-19 rapid antigen tests could be administered, but the cost would be far too much for the company. 
Even in a best case scenario, if Darden were able to purchase take-home tests for employees at $15 each, even if only 20 employees per store took it, it would cost the company over $1 million per day to do this, which would tear into cash flows way too much. Perhaps a better solution would be to offer a paid time off incentive. Like many companies such as Aldi, McDonald's, and Target, Darden could go one step further and give its employees paid time off in order to get vaccinated. With the average hourly paid employee of Darden's 135,000 earning $17 per hour for the company, added to the $20 per hour pay you could give to 60,000 salary-based workers you have, it would cost the company around $21 million in employee pay to have each of these workers vaccinated if six hours were given to do this. For employees not comfortable with taking the vaccine, we could offer an educational course. This course would cost the company between $144,000 and $360,000. With free cash flow at $253 million during the most recent financial quarter, this is very accomplishable for the company. Although Darden could choose not to give this money to employees, many other companies have set the precedent of doing this because it is, it is an affordable way to stimulate positivity over workforce vaccinations. Another specific solution could be to offer a promotion to customers who are vaccinated, such as a discount. Krispy Kreme announced that starting on March 22nd, 2021, vaccinated individuals can receive a free glazed donut. Other local restaurants and businesses have taken to this trend, but Darden has the opportunity to become one of the first multi-billion dollar corporations to have discounts as such. Although doing thorough analysis on this potential vaccine marketing decision would be too speculative to place a dollar amount on, it could still bring positive attention as well as new customers to the business. Now on to Claudia for our legal considerations. Thank you, Matt. Now I would like to discuss some of the legal factors and considerations for this case. A county detention center in New Mexico is facing a lawsuit from an employee regarding a COVID-19 vaccine mandate in the detention center that the detention center has put in place. Isaac Legaretta claims that he was not made aware from the detention center of the potential benefits and risks of being vaccinated and the extent to which some benefits are unknown. Legaretta states that he does not want to be forced by his employer to be a guinea pig. While the outcome of the lawsuit is yet to be determined, the detention center has gained national attention and undoubtedly substantial legal expenses. This is why Darden must be extremely cautious and emphasize the need for education on the vaccine and the pandemic. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 states that employers must grant accommodations for employees that have religious beliefs that prevent them from getting the COVID-19 vaccine or other vaccines in general. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses are not allowed to get the COVID-19 vaccine because the vaccine is fused with antibodies from survivors of COVID that will then get injected into one's bloodstream. This process does not align with their belief system. Employers that are subject to the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as the ADA, must provide reasonable exceptions to employees that have disabilities. As with other common vaccinations, over time, certain accommodations must be made for individuals who are at a higher risk of allergic and are potentially deadly reactions to the vaccine. It can be difficult to mandate the COVID-19 vaccine throughout the entire company when some employees will still be exempt from it for, because of disabilities and for religious reasons as well. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also known as OSHA, requires all employers to provide a safe and healthy workplace for their employees. Darden restaurants can keep meeting these expectations by upholding your mask policies in all locations, strongly encouraging and advocating for employees to get the COVID-19 vaccines and, and providing more education on the vaccine and the COVID-19 pandemic itself. The decision in terms of both how and when the vaccines are distributed to the public is left up to the individual states themselves. Different states also have different labor laws in terms of mandating vaccines for employees. The harshness and regulations varies greatly from state to state. 
Even though Darden Restaurants is headquartered in Florida, it is much more difficult to enforce a mandate of the COVID-19 vaccine nationwide within the company, considering that Darden Restaurants has employees in every state where labor laws differ. It is also important to note that healthcare workers, first responders, the elderly, and those that are immunocompromised or are of high risk for complications from COVID-19 due to other medical conditions are the highest and first priority for vaccine administration not restaurant employees specifically. After reviewing Title VII, the ADA, and OSHA, we have concluded that by not mandating the COVID-19 vaccine, you will be within your legal rights and even potentially avoid litigation. There would be no legal benefit for the company to enforce such a policy. Now back to Talia for the ethical considerations and factors. Beyond the legal and financial impacts of your decision, you must also consider the ethical implications of a mandate. It has become clear that the path forward in the United States is the availability and accessibility of the COVID-19 vaccine. Darden has recognized the dangers of the virus through its previous implementation of work safety initiatives. However, as one of the leading competitors in the industry, Darden has the unique opportunity to set precedent within its decision regarding a vaccination mandate. As recently as February of 2021, less than 1% of US company samples had mandated COVID vaccinations within their workforce. The majority of vaccine mandates have been required by universities. Rutgers University in New Jersey was the first school to go public with their plan to mandate vaccinations for all students attending in the fall. The list has since grown to include two Ivy League universities, Brown and Cornell, as well as Duke University and a dozen more joining the list. It is likely that many more schools will continue to release vaccination requirements over the coming months. However, it is unlikely that the increase in university mandates will carry over to other industries. Colleges have been struggling since the beginning of the pandemic to contain outbreaks within their campuses. They pose a unique threat within their communities as many students eat, sleep, and study in tight quarters. Although a vaccination requirement appears necessary in an environment as such, Universities are also able to offer a clear accommodation to the mandate, online classes. Unfortunately, other organizations, such as Darden and the restaurant industry, are unable to operate without customer-facing employees. Therefore, a vaccination requirement would have to provide certain accommodations for employees that cannot take a vaccine, but still risk losing employees who are not protected under legal exceptions and do not wish to be vaccinated. For these universities and other companies requiring vaccination, the common good outweighs individual choice. We too must weigh the delicate balance between our responsibility for public safety and the preservation of individual autonomy. As for our purposes today, we have defined human autonomy as the right of the individual to make informed and uncoerced decisions. Within the debate over policy mandating vaccination, Companies have argued that it is in the best interest of the public to require workers to become vaccinated as soon as reasonably possible. We are not here to argue the merits of a va vaccinated population. Rather, we would like you to consider the role that individual choice plays in the matter. We have already discussed the legal risks of mandating vaccination for workforces, including protected populations. There must also be an advocate for the rights of the individual. We believe that it is unethical to require vaccination with the impending threat of joblessness. Public safety has clearly been of concern to Darden since the outbreak of the virus. You have implemented the use of hand sanitizer stations and mask policies. However, it has been claimed that the only way to ensure public safety is through a mandating policy for the entire company. We do not support the idea that herd immunity is only achievable through corporate policy. Rather, we believe that encouragement of the vaccine without regulating its administration could yield equal or better rates of vaccination within the corporation. First, we would like to review two of your corporate values, respect and inclusion and diversity. Within your proclamation of company values, you state, people, both team members and guests, are at the heart of everything we do, and we never forget it. It is this statement and those company values that we have chosen to guide our recommendations. Certain populations such as women, African-Americans and individuals of low socioeconomic status have shown lower rates of intention to be vaccinated. 
Two of the main considerations when assessing vaccination rates are the level of personal concern an individual has for their own safety and the amount of trust that they have in the vaccine. We believe the low rates of intent to be vaccinated correlate with low accessibility to resources that would disavow myths about the virus and vaccination process. The ethical stance the company should take is one that equally benefits the company and its employees, including those who are willingly vaccinated, those who cannot be vaccinated for religious or medical reasons, and those who are uninformed or unwilling. The ethical dilemma comes down to whether Darden needs to require vaccinations for its employees, or if you can fulfill your responsibility of safe service through voluntary participation. It may be of concern that if they are not required to be vaccinated, the employees of Darden will not elect to be vaccinated. However, research has shown that pro-social behavior occurs naturally and will even decrease if fear is used as a motivator. Pro-social behavior has been shown to increase in circumstances such that the individual feels personally affected and therefore empathetic to the cause. This phenomenon has been observed through social exchange theory, the idea that limiting costs and emphasizing benefits will increase altruistic behavior. Therefore, our recommendation will allow for proper COVID education and company emphasis on vaccination support. Next, Stephen will further discuss our recommendations. Thank you, Talia. We recommend that Darden encourages employees to take the COVID-19 vaccine as it leads to many potential benefits that have been mentioned in the presentation. For those who do not feel comfortable with taking the COVID-19 vaccine, there is an option of taking a COVID-19 educational course. Regardless of which of the two employees choose, they will be compensated for six hours of their regular pay, up to $20 an hour. The six hours of compensation have been calculated with travel and vaccination wait lines in mind. Employees will not have the option to be compensated for both, but will be encouraged to participate in both. In doing so, Darden will be giving equal rewards to individuals who have already elected to be vaccinated and those who are not able due to medical or religious restrictions. The COVID-19 informational resources will be accessible to all employees through their current work platform, Crowd. Crowd is available to employees through a computer or their mobile device, and will be updated with a COVID-19 portal, which will include the course, links to CDC updates and guidelines, workplace safety resources, and proof of vaccination submission form. The course itself will be a series of asynchronous video lectures emphasizing the importance of maintaining a healthy workplace, explaining the current initiatives in, the, in place with Darden restaurants, and promoting informed vaccination decisions. The offering of this course serves as a way to give employees who are not able or are comfortable with taking the vaccine the same compensation as others in the company, as well as an opportunity for all employees to access company COVID-19 resources. As we saw earlier, we expect that many DART employees will or have already received their coronavirus vaccination. These employees will have access to the same resources on their crowd app as well as a form to submit proof of vaccination. Neither those who complete the course nor those who are vaccinated will be required to self-report their vaccination status to their immediate management. Rather, human resources will be, human resources will receive reports directly from the crowd application. We believe that creating an environment of informed, respected individuals will encourage apathetic employees who did not intend on being vaccinated to reconsider their stance. Our recommendations follow the previously mentioned social exchange theory. By increasing acceptance and gratitude, we are increasing the benefits associated with vaccination. Through the incentive of paid time off, we are limiting the financial and time barriers that may constrain employees. We believe that this framework has the potential to encourage even higher vaccination rates within Darden than the general public. We are excited to field your questions regarding our recommendations and thank you for your time. Okay, that was perfect timing. I was about to give the five minute warning and you ended right on time, okay? Um, I, I, I'll start by saying I think that that was very well done. And uh, as the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the management here at Darden 
I think you made some very, very enlightening uh, recommendations. I would like to just say that I think your recommendations are well received and that we will certainly consider them. And I'd like to hear from some of the other members of the staff. Yeah, yeah just, I, I, just, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, okay. Yeah, Jesse here. I just wanted to say that uh, I second that. This was a excellent uh presentation you all did a fantastic job of highlighting the main interest to us here at darton and uh you know we have a we take a leadership position as you know in the in in the industry so we're always looking for ways that we can promote and show our our leadership so yeah we really i really like how you hit on some of the struggles that we're having as a as a executive team here in order to how we can ethically you know, still do good for the our our employees, while also making sure that we um, protect the the rights and, and freedoms that they have. Uh, you hit right on the head of our you know uh, our struggle right now with, with the common good outweighing the individual rights, and so I think that your recommendation is is well received here. However, I I'm I'll, I'll have a little bit of concerns with the. Uh, a few of those financials that you presented, I wasn't clear what the financial risk would be on the side of, of mandating versus un, uh, not mandating. Uh, I'm not sure what the financial re repercussions would be um, entirely. If we did that, I'd like to see a little bit more risk analysis. Um, on the ethical side, I think that you did a good job of strat straddling between the two main concerns that we have and, at Darden here. And I think that there is certainly a, a lot of the recommendations that you made that we will take into consideration. One thing I would like to know is under what circumstances would you make a recommendation of mandate? What would have to happen in, um, and what would be the, the, the case where you would recommend a mandate? Is there any uh, situations under which you would uh, not recommend the straddling uh, hybrid approach and recommend a mandate? Thank you. Sure, so um, are we allowed to answer the questions right now? Yes, yes, please do. Perfect, Perfect. So um, the recommendations that we have made with the straddling approach as we have considered it are given the um, general public's acceptance of the vaccination. And so we really focused on the standard Americans intent to be vaccinated and the increase that we have seen over the last several months. And so we would have to revisit the um, mandating policy in the case that the general public's faith or trust in the vaccination dropped or if their intent to mandate or if their intent to be vaccinated, pardon me, uh, dropped. And so in that situation, we would revisit. However, as it currently stands with the great percentage of uh, Americans looking to be vaccinated, we hope that we will be able to continue with giving them the choice. Thank you. I was just just a little follow up when you said that the common good outweighs the uh, individual rights in your recommendations when, uh, under the ethics section. I was just curious what uh, what situation would you know be in line with that recommendation in terms from an ethics point of view. Um, we certainly want to take a leadership position, and as the largest you know restaurant chain. Uh, sit down restaurant chain we I, I think it's important that we do take a leadership position so uh, i'd be interested in knowing when when uh, you would make that recommendation for us but that was a good answer thank you thank you i have a legal question uh as the darden family considers the hybrid approach if we were to go to the um approach where we mandated it would we be able to do that legally without the vaccination being a legally approved as opposed to the uh, temporary approval that they've received? Um, as it stands right now, uh, you would be able to, um, given the current circumstances, um, we are allowed to, um, you would be allowed to mandate the vaccine. Um. Furthermore, it's currently under emergency use, and so the FDA has given their thumbs up for uh, 
mandating policies. However, as we stated, there are those two protected classes, and so we would need to provide accommodations as such. So I have a, a question that may have a follow-up question to it, and it goes back to the ethics um, portion of your presentation. You had you set up the dilemma to be a choice or at least a consideration that the company, among others, but that the company needs to make between, uh, you described it as public safety versus individual rights. And so in my role, as a director of this company, my question is, how should we as this company define public safety? Like what is our framework for understanding what our role in public safety is? Right, perfect. And so um, throughout our ethical recommendations, we really did go back and forth between the individual choice and the public safety. And we came to the conclusion that our responsibility for public safety extends to the value that we place in our consumers. And so within our stakeholder analysis, we slightly touched upon how if our workforce comes down with the coronavirus, then we could potentially uh, transmit it to the individuals coming to visit our establishment and therefore the surrounding community. And so we look at it as our responsibility to make sure we're doing our part in the communities that we serve uh, to keep them safe and keep them healthy as an extension of our own restaurants in those communities. I guess my question is still why? How, how is it, in other words, I'm, let me give you an example of what I'm not prepared to do, right? Like as the director of this company, I'm not prepared to teach all of my employees personal self-defense, right? I'm, I'm not gonna teach them to how to fight and how to protect themselves against bad people. I'm, I'm not going to go out and I'm going, not gonna teach them about, um, I don't know, uh, other types of public safety issues, what clean drinking water is like. I'm not gonna go out and teach them how to raise children. There are all kinds of aspects of public safety that I don't have to worry about. And I'm, I'm wondering why this area of public safety is now our concern. I mean, our, we're, we're not in the epidemiology business, we're in the serving food business. Why is this part of public safety our concern? Perfect. So, so I, can, I can help you answer that, uh, Talia. Um, so the reason why we wanna participate in educating um, our employees and playing a proactive role in this is because it's the COVID-19 pandemic simply. It's a pandemic that shut down the entire world for, um, it, depends, it depends on what you consider shutting down, but perhaps over a year. So we know that COVID-19 materially impacts all of the communities um, that exist and all the uh, communities that Darden serves in. So that's why we recommend that you educate and, um, and promote employee vaccinations to make uh, a big difference because it is a huge deal in the communities that Dalton serves. Right, and furthermore, um, additionally in line with the values, we do um, value our employees. And then furthermore, if you're asking how it's directly related to the company, as Matt went over, at one point, uh, a large percentage of our restaurants were uh, closed or temporarily or permanently due to the pandemic. Therefore, it, the community health directly impacts our financial earnings. And so beyond our just responsibility to the communities that we serve, it also impacts the company financially. So what I heard from that is that as a director of the company, I should be able to define public safety based on whether or not I can open up more restaurants and put more people through our restaurants and that those public safety aspects that help fill my restaurants is the limit. That's, is that the definition of public safety or those actions that best fill our restaurants? It's those actions I'd say that are uh, directly accountable by the choices that our company have made. And so those actions that directly contribute to the safety of the community as you stated, we don't need to teach them self-defense and what our employees do on their own time is 
up to them, but it is our responsibility that within our companies, we're providing a safe workforce for those who do come uh, to our restaurants. Thank you. In your recommendation, it, it looks like you were the hybrid included two things, either vaccination or education. What about our requirement as a company to do things like masking, temperature taking, and just testing for those who may be infected? I, I think those are some other sides and, and, and I don't specifically don't recall you talking about temperature taking or uh, testing. So all of those are super important things that the company is already doing. Uh, hand sanitizing stations are placed throughout the restaurant, as well as restrooms are available to um, partake in frequent hand washing. Um, masking is required uh, within the restaurants until customers are seated at their tables, uh, and then they're allowed to take the mask off to eat, and then they must uh, wear the mask again to um, leave the restaurant. So a lot of what you're already saying is already being uh, implemented in our restaurants and are very important uh, to uh, slowing the spread of COVID-19. Uh, but the recommendation that we made are uh, ideas that are less commonly stated and uh, are very important in uh, helping Darden become good stewards in the community. If you don't mind, I have a, a small input here. Uh, first of all, great, great performance uh, from all of you. Um, my question is uh, uh, part ethical, part legal. Uh, in restaurants that are, let's say, uh, the, the segmented restaurants that are the largest uh, in our, uh, in our uh, portfolio, uh, are, we, are we ethical and legal if we, say, uh, promote some kind of pilot project where we would uh, entice the restaurants of, uh, I mean, the employees of these restaurants uh, in some of the largest areas or maybe the, the areas that are hardest hit um, and then entice them with some kind of uh, motivational schemes to get um, uh, vaccinated and then use that uh, as a reference site uh, of what will happen if the whole restaurant is vaccinated and, and uh, how the community responds to that. Would that be ethical or legal or can we do something like that? Um, so as Claudia touched upon, we are currently within our legal right to mandate vaccinations within our restaurants. Although there is that one lawsuit and we have not uh, been able to see the verdict. And so that will kind of pave the path forward on mandation or mandating policies. And so we are within our legal grounds to do as such. And that is something we can definitely take into consideration. I think that you're correct in saying that we would prefer to stay on the incentivizing path rather than mandating because we are highlighting the respect and uh, the inclusion in the corporate values. However, it's definitely something that we can look into if you wish. And we could sample a few uh, restaurants in more high risk areas. And to add to what Talia was saying, um, compensating employees is a part of our recommendation. We, play, we pay, plan to pay employees a total of six hours of their normally paid um, wages up to $20 an hour. An important consideration to remember is that we think that you um, should be careful in considering whether some employees should uh, receive different compensation than others. Uh, that would be potentially unfair and discriminatory. Uh, this was included when we talked a little bit about uh, compensating people who did not want to take the vaccine and rather take the educational course. We would uh, compensate them uh, the same amount as if they took the vaccine because we don't want to discriminate against those who are uncomfortable for uh, one of many reasons. So it would be illegal for us to uh, uh, give a pay raise to those who uh, take the vaccine? A permanent pay raise? Was that? Uh, yes, I, I, I say, I mean, I, you know, let's explore both sides of the equation, uh, permanent or uh, um, temporary. 
Sure, I think that um, in the case of a permanent pay raise that would violate, I believe both Title VII and the Americans with Disabilities Act because that would be giving an unfair advantage to those who are able-bodied and able to receive the vaccination. And so a permanent, uh, a permanent raise is probably not an avenue we'd explore just for the legal aspect. However, in certain areas, we are giving the extra paid time off. And so if we find that the implementation of the six hours of pay is not adequate to raise the vaccination levels, we can definitely investigate other avenues of incentives such as more paid time off or a flat rate of uh, monetary incentive. So that is within our legal rights, but I do not believe that uh, we would legally be able to give a permanent raise. Great, part thank you. I'm sorry, part of our corporate culture is that we uh, want to tie to our values, diversity and inclusion. Do you foresee any need to offer something in the way of uh, inclusion um, in an educational way around those uh, groups that may have some policy or uh, something that, that is against taking the vaccination. We, you're talking about offering education of why it's important. Do you foresee that we could be exposing ourselves by not uh, offering something along the realm of those individuals who feel, whether it be religiously, ethically or whatever, that it's not appropriate to take the vaccination. Yes, absolutely. I think that would be a, um, a great recommendation. I think that's definitely an important aspect that um, needs further education as well. I think that's definitely something that could be included too. Thank you for your input. Thanks. And just to add on to that, I think that within our course, as we stated, human autonomy is informed and uncoerced decisions. And so our course offering in the education on COVID is not intended to guilt individuals who do not prefer to take the vaccination, rather give them the information resources if they would like to uh, take the vaccination, as well as just general um, workplace safety initiatives that we have in place. And so we additionally touch upon that inclusion and diversity value within our decision to have our vaccination submission form go straight to HR. And so they can handle the uh, monetary value because we don't think it's appropriate for everyone in the workplace to be aware of who is getting right because it is a personal decision and we're leaving it up to the individual. And so we're handling this on a higher level in HR in order to maintain that uh, discretion. Uh, Jesse here again. Yeah, we. Uh, you're, it sounds like you're asking us to spend a bit of money on uh, these this program in this educational program, and also perhaps on the incentives. And uh, you know, of course, we want to do good um, as much as we can. We're willing to make an investment, but we still have shareholders to be responsible to. And you know, we we have to justify this to them uh, as well. And we're always kind of in a little bit of tension with them regarding you know doing initiatives uh, of this nature. So my, I'm just wondering if you have any sort of framework or advice that you could give us when us as leaders kind of our fiduciary duty kind of conflicts with our moral or ethical decisions. Thanks. Thank you for asking that question. So obviously it is uh, in the interest of stakeholders for Darden uh, to do what would best suit their financial interest or exposure in the company. Um, something that we are seeing today is an, an increased um, level of concern in ESG and that plays exactly into this. We are planning, um, us, Top Hat Consulting, recommend that Darden spend around $21 million uh, for this program and as explained earlier, with $253 million currently sitting in free cash flows, that is a, a very reasonable number and is something that uh, Darden can do uh, without tearing into cash flows too much. Um, as far um, as financial concern, uh, it shouldn't be a material uh, concern because materiality can be defined as 5% um, or over, and that would actually be less than 5% of free cash flows. 
Um, so it is very accomplishable for the company. And even from a, not only from an ethical standpoint of view, but from a financial standpoint of view, uh, we believe that it is also financially in the best interest of Darden because it creates um, a better environment for employees. Uh, it communicates that uh, Darden has the uh, the culture and the initiative to make sure that their environments are safe environments. Uh, so not only would uh, this be the right decision ethically for you, it would also be the right decision financially. Thank you. So you're saying that your recommendation, is, in your opinion, is the most ethical uh, choice going forward and also the most profitable. Is that correct? Yes, um, I could add to that. Um, have other companies and competitors are participating um, in this initiative. Um, let's see, Talia, could you go to my slide on what other companies are doing in the appendix? Yes, one second. There you are. So here's what other large um, companies are doing in the US. They're doing the same thing. You can see Aldi, um, what Darden is doing uh, currently now, uh, as far as McDonald's and Target are giving all their employees four hours to go get the vaccination. vaccination. And Kroger is actually going a step forward into giving its employees a flat rate of $100. So why do I bring this up? It's because other companies are doing this and they find it uh, to be the best financial and ethical decision to make um, so we at Top Hat Consulting believe that Darden should play into this environment. It's the way the business environment is going uh, concerning COVID-19 and these vaccinations, and we believe that Darden should be a player in it as also. Thank you. Okay, I think we have exhausted our time for uh, question and answers to Top Hat from the board. At this point, uh, I'd just like to say, I think you guys did a, a fabulous job, uh, very smooth, seamless. You knew the information well, you handed off uh, in terms of responding to questions. I think it was a, a, a top notch, first quality uh, presentation. Your facts were good. Uh, I like the fact that you gave options and you continue to tie things to uh, core ethical principles. And I think that's important for you in this competition because it is a business ethics competition and the most credit is allowed in the area of ethics. So I think you did a fabulous job. Yeah, agreed. Well, very well done team. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Good luck to you. Thank you. Okay, well, um, just going forward, I would say that uh, be certain that in the next phases you hone in even more on your ethical principles because you'll find that in the 10 minute and the 90 second presentation, ethics is what will be weighed uh, to um, a specific, and that, that'll be your key thing. So uh, keep working towards that and uh, good luck. Ahmed, okay. did you have anything more you wanted to add? Yeah, I think one more, you know, just last comment is data. I mean, I think, uh, I saw some data and I saw some numbers and statistics, but I think uh, more data on infection rates on, uh, you know, the, basically if you, if you guys just do a, a bit more on uh, data analysis and visualizations uh, from maybe in particular restaurant areas and so on, and use those as reference sites uh, that might enhance the, uh, uh, you know, your overall performance. Mm -hmm. And just one last thing. I think uh, just overall, I think you did a, a, a really great job. But I mean, I, I would have liked to have seen um, you do go a little bit further and above what the is is happening in the industry. Something a little bit more uh, innovative would have would have been nice to see. But uh, but overall, you did a fantastic job. Uh, my feedback is, I think, similar to what other people are offering, and that is, I really. If I'm really sitting on the board of a company, I I really can't just look at one alternative and the cost of that one alternative. I, I have to see it in comparison to other things and, and why this one may not be perfect, 
right? I, it's not just this is the best one. It's that this one, this alternative has various strengths and weaknesses. The other alternatives also have various strengths and weaknesses. And I need to show you why this one still wins out over the others, even if it isn't perfect. The presentation is very professional and very clean and it's very well ordered. I liked a lot about the way you structured everything. But throughout, I felt like you're only leading me down one path without any sense for, okay, now you want me to spend $21 million and I don't know how else I could spend that $21 million. It's not just sitting there doing nothing. There, somebody had a plan for that $21 million and it could be used for another alternative to solve the same problem that you're trying to solve, but it could be used in a totally different way. And, and as a director, I'm trying to make that calculation is, is this the best way to spend that 21 million and why? How do I justify that expenditure compared to the other alternatives? And that, that comparison of alternatives is the thing that I didn't see and it made it hard for me as a director to say, I'm, a, I'm on board 100%. Yeah, just to add to what John said there, uh, that, that was what I was kind of getting at, a cost benefit analysis, a comparison in the beginning, I, it would have been much more helpful. And also, you know, a, credibility in terms of if we're, this is a real boardroom, credibility is hard to earn. And, and so you have to basically lead me to make it my decision. And so, you know, you have to present, uh, you know, a, a number of them. And then, you know, you're, you're, we're going to have to come to the decision on our own in some ways in order for it to be implemented. I always say the best solution is the one that can be implemented. And, and the one that gets implemented is the one with buy-in. So, yeah, if you just lead, like, like John said, down us one, one path, then it's harder for us to get buy-in because we didn't get enough, uh, you know, sort of a time for us to assess the different, the different outcomes. But, but again, overall, very well done. What, one thing that this format doesn't really uh, encourage a discussion of, and I, because I know you've got the three buckets and the places where you need to kind of say certain things, but one area where I think you could also maybe expand is um, reputational risk, because it, it's very hard to define, right? You, how much money you put into your reputation and why you do something. But what you guys have, or what we, what we have is a you know, as a company is a brand or a collection of brand names. And so we're not just looking at the communities. We're not just looking at the financial health of the organization. We're also looking at what does that brand mean to people and what are we willing to spend because our efforts here will contribute to that brand, those brands that I know the family of brands or not. And I know it's hard to measure, but I, I think that's a for a big company, that that reputational risk and the way you uh, you put a measure on it, I think, is a relevant consideration. Yeah, and just to, just to add to that as well, and you know, I, it was really focused a lot on risk mitigation, which makes perfect sense. But it, I would have been nice if there was an opportunity as well. Further to my other comment, which was like, is there a competitive advantage? So maybe maybe it's a chance for us to really take a leadership role. Now, when you said that, uh, you know, uh, because we are, you know, the largest sit down restaurant, well, that gives us a chance to actually take a competitive role. I mean, what are the advantages maybe that would, will come with that rather than just a, you know, a, a, and I understand that you had a format that you needed to follow, but that would have been quite, a, quite an interesting thing to see as well. Okay, well, I thank everyone for their participation. Uh, I wish you guys luck going forward in the next two presentations and uh, fellow board members and judges, I thank you for your input. I always learn something from you as well. So thank you and um, good luck. Everybody stay safe. Good luck. Thanks. All right.